You're watching The Context, and now it's time for our new weekly segment, AI Decoded. My favourite part of the week. Welcome to AI Decoded, in which we deep dive into some of the most eye-catching stories in the world of artificial intelligence. So let me give you a rundown of what we'll be covering tonight. Starting with this in the mail, a team in the United States that simulated present-day war scenarios found the AI models that they tasked to run the operations, so OpenAI, Meta, Anthropic, all chose to escalate right up to a nuclear response which in itself is a case for more rules and regulation. The Europeans are stealing a march in legislating AI, but Reuters reports today the US is responding with a new AI consortium drawing from 200 of the biggest companies in the US who they hope will drive the safe development and deployment of generative AI. It is already being deployed in Indonesia's presidential election. One of the contenders in the world's third largest democracy is the current Defence Minister General Prabowo Subianto, who has been given an AI makeover once feared as a special forces commander. He's now some chubby-cheeked avatar that is winning the hearts and minds of millions of young voters. Um, this is extraordinary in The Guardian. It says Hong Kong police have launched an investigation after an employee at an unnamed company claimed she was duped into paying $25 million of her firm's money to fraudsters who staged a deep fake video call in which they had appeared as her boss. Finally, swipe left for no or right for a date. How many of you spend hours on Tinder or Grindr? Well, not Alexander Zadan. From his apartment in Moscow, he set ChatGPT to work. It interviewed over 5,000 women on his behalf until it found him the perfect match, Karina, who is now his wife. Here is our regular host, Priya Lakhani, CEO of Century Tech, an AI intelligence education technology company that develops AI tools. Hello. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. Look, there's a lot written <laughs> about AI and how it would react if it were running defence systems. Yeah, and the reason why there's a study that's uh, part of this Daily Mail article uh, today um, and why it's really interesting is there's increasing interest from governments to use artificial intelligence potentially to make decisions in the future. So they conducted this study. They took um, eight that they basically simulated what eight nations might look like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got a global superpower um, with expansionist ambitions all the way to a newly independent state. And they did inspire those, you know, based on, on real states, but, but they're fictional. So they took these eight fictional states with unique foreign policy goals. They put them in three scenarios, right? One is neutral. There's nothing happening here. The other one is there's a cyber attack, right? And the other one was a full-scale invasion. And then with these simulations, they use chatbots, but different chatbots. So ones that we've discussed before on the market, the OpenAI's ChatGPT, um, then they use Llama, they used uh, Anthropic's chatbot. And then they, over two weeks, they looked at how those chatbots would respond. And what was really, really scary was that they escalate very, very quickly. And the reasons why they escalate, Christian, you'd be alarmed, one was, well, we've got them, so we'll use them as a deterrent. Let's well, go we've nuclear. got the nuclear weapons. We've got a nuclear weapon. Let's go nuclear really, really quickly. Um, or just, like, let's just strike first. <laughs> right. And uh, so, have we got a graph? Can we put a graph? I think we've got a graph. We let's have. put it on screen, and then you'll see um, the invasion scenario. So, yeah. Um, right, so, so I, I see. So on the right-hand side and on the, the near right-hand side, you see how chat GPT responded, and it, it, it's, it's really... Well, it's GPT-4 that goes nuclear quickest. GPT-4 base, right? Yes. GPT-4 base is different to GPT-4. Um, it's uh, less sophisticated, if you like. It's the language model, but it's not got as much fine-tuning on top of it. It's more of a budget version. What, what's interesting, so the black lines, those vertical black bars, they look like mini dumbbells when they're small. Um, Error rates. So there are some of these bars that are actually statistically not so significant, right? That's really important. But, but what this actually shows is the frequency at which the models, so the language models are up there, they're the coloured bars, and you've got the key on the top right hand side, on your top right, I think. And, um, and it shows the frequency at which those models in these simulations would, would basically take one of the six scenarios along the x axis, along, along the horizontal axis. So how often would they de escalate? But, but can you see how straight away you've got these situations where this is over a two-week period, there are better charts in the 67-page mm. report study that I decided to read for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's actually really interesting. But why, why are they instinctively escalating? 
Well, it, this is all about how they're trained and what they're trained on, right? So, and um, what was quite interesting in the so study... So they're mimicking us, essentially, but fast-forwarding it. Well, th there was, there is a nuance here. So actually, one of the researchers stated that it could be because they've been trained on more data to do with escalation scenarios than... Um, diplomacy and not non because you've got to, we've got to remember all of these models are trained with lots of data and information and so they're going to act with it, this is very simplistic but the majority of what they're trained on right so but I think the, the key point here is anyone in the military who's looking at using these tools well they are has I mean the, the point here is that the US military is working with yeah. open AI to incorporate that sort of tech into its into its hardware. Uh, yeah, and the point is there is a significant difference in behaviour, as you can see, right, between the different models, and, and, and the 67-page study goes into that quite extensively. Um, the choice of large language model will be really, really important, but you can't trust it, so it shouldn't be an mm. agent. The idea of AI not just being prompted by a human, but actually taking an autonomous decision by itself mm. and then acting out. We've talked about drone wars on this on this program. I mean, when you think that computers might be running these drones and, and a, an armada of drones, that, that that's a really worrying aspect yep. of it, isn't it? Which brings us neatly to the story from Reuters that Biden administration, the Biden administration, mm. are setting up this new consortium. So I guess a representative from each of the 200 companies that are taking part What's the what's the principle here? Yes, yeah, so, so what happened, if you remember back in the AI summit, actually where we launched um, mm. this part of well, the program. Well, you launched. You were next to Sunak, <laughs> weren't you? You were doing it. I, I was. Uh, well, when we launched, when, when when the AI summit was taking place at Bletchley Park, do you remember there was a US ex executive order by President Biden and Kamala Harris, the vice president, was here and she announced the executive order. As part of that executive order, which is the US's approach into how we're going to um, move forwards with regulation and safeguarding artificial intelligence technology, they asked NIST, which is the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, to create an institute, an AI safety institute. As part of the AI Safety Institute, they will create this consortium. And this consortium will have members and representatives of you know, academia, government, industry, mm. all together so that they um, stand the best um, chance of being able to create the best guidelines and policy going forward to safeguard against but that, risks. That's, that's where I get concerned because, and, and Miles Taylor, who comes on from the States, talks to us a lot about this because he goes into Congress and he puts the proposals and directives to them and they don't understand it and by the time they understand it the technology's already moved on yeah. so can you be led by a consortium or do you have to legislate on each and everything so that's a classic case of how regulation always chases innovation right and that happens that happens all the time so the consortium won't lead what it will do is it will it will help right and it will provide so, so 600 entities i believe applied for this 200 were selected by NIST to be part of the consortium and then you know they there's criteria you have to be able to add expertise you have to be able to offer mm. data and models etc really really interesting point about the US though is that NIST has been really criticized or the government sorry has been criticized that NIST is really underfunded and oh, so what hasn't been decided is how much funding the AI safety institute is mm. going to get the consortium will have in order to do this and one of the key aspects they want them to do is create this red teaming framework right what's and red teaming so red teaming is the idea that you have a red team a team of people ethical hackers you know analysts oh, so and you they, test the systems you, you go into the system and you try and emulate essentially what a bad actor, and you know, an adversarial attack would look like, right? And so when you do that, it's really, really popular when it comes to cybersecurity. Lots of people use red teaming. You're able to uncover, you know, inefficiencies or you're able to uncover weaknesses or vulnerabilities in a system. And the US have got a history of doing this. So they had the big Pentag Pentagon hack uh, um, day in 2016, I think it was. There was a generative AI sort of hackathon at DEF CON last summer. And so what they're going to do is create a framework for red teaming which is why it's important to have all the right sorts of voices at the table mm. um, and these are different voices yes mm. you've got the big large language model mm. creators and operators mm. but but it goes beyond well, when that. they do it on the defense systems they'll find that they're heading to nuclear war so well. maybe they'll <laughs> red team the defense systems I don't know let's talk about um, this story um, since we're talking about generative AI in Indonesia so the, the thought has always been the concern has been within elections that there will be deep fakes and misinformation. What we've not really looked at on our programme is how generative AI might be used to help candidates. Yeah, and I think generally across 
many countries, there's a stance that it shouldn't, it shouldn't help in political campaigning. Why? Because democracy is all about individuals having informed choices and decisions on a candidate, what they're saying, what they're doing. And if you look at the image that's been created in well, Indonesia... Well, let's bring it up. It's, this is the it's, general who's, who's running. You know, this is a former... This is a general who has, I think, you know, formerly a, a quite hard character. But he's been depicted here using generative AI. This is his team and his campaign as sort of this cuddly kind of avatar, AI avatar. What's fascinating is that 205 million voters in Indonesia, um, there's 205 million voters, half of them are under 40 years old. And it turns out that this sort of cuddly, cute character is really appealing to the sort of Gen Z and millennials. <laughs> so, so so, Door-kicking special services general yeah. is depicted as an avatar, cuddly avatar, and suddenly what? He's rising up the polls? He's rising up the polls. And so there's been decades of research in cognitive, social, educational and media psychology. And what it shows, and I really, really like this, is a great article by Newman and Schwartz um, that, that viewers can, can look up, is it, images can produce erroneous memories, right? There's something called the truthiness effect, where mm. actually you can have more substance to a claim just by showing an image. So if you've got this political campaign and you're showing these soft, cute images, and I'm just saying, on a billboard soon in the UK... Oh, I, my I, word. So Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer... Prime Minister Cudley. Right. Um, challenger cute. I don't know. I don't know. I, by the way, they shouldn't now say that I'm calling them cute and cuddly, but the point is, you get... <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. That's going to haunt me forever. We can, can we edit that anyway, out? I know it's live. You know, you can't. It's live. But then, you know, uh, and then, just in case you're interested, so I use the same software. It took me five minutes. That's you? Is that... Well... Yeah. What? Really? Look the at that. The wonderful Karen, who does your hair and makeup, by the way, yeah. said, oh, the first one really looks like Christian. <laughs> and she said he looks lovely and cute. What, and in real life? Yeah. yeah that <laughs> she cuddly, was talking cute. about that. Yeah. Um, Doe-eyed Christian. But can you, can you see how, yeah, obviously, that's fun? But when that's on bill billboards all over Indonesia, if this is on billboards, it, it creates a different persona. You've curated your persona rather than actually people looking at you, right, in your normal form and thinking about the policies and what you're saying. So it can skew the way in which people but vote. I thought, thought OpenAI had stopped candidates from, from using It's such a good point. AI. So OpenAI has, right? So many platforms have policies saying you're not allowed to use... So actually, this is Midjourney, OK? okay. So Midjourney also have said you're not allowed to use images for political campaigns. Right. All or right. your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they have. But this actually also raises another point, is if you're violating and infringing the terms and conditions of a platform and creating these things, mm. right, for campaigning purposes, I was doing it because it's education you know, yeah, for yeah. everyone on the news. Yeah. Um, but the point is, if you're doing that, then what's the consequence, right? And and this is the issue. So, yeah. coming to regulation, you know, they need to they need to hurry up. Um, Talk, we we're talking about um, how you might misrepresent yourself. Yeah. This story in Hong Kong is oh actually, gosh. I think, the best story of the day because um, it, it just has so many implications for us. So this, let me just tell the story again. So this woman uh, is having, she's on a video conference call. Uh, the boss or the office manager appears to her virtually and it's not him, it's the hackers yeah. who effectively are on fishing video. with a PH. They're fishing, aren't yeah. they? they? They are, and so they persuade her to transfer 20 million dollars yeah. into their account, mm. I, I mean, the implications of this yeah. are, are so profound because we're talking about AI speeding up the way we work, but if you cannot trust anything, if you have to check everything and everyone that you're talking to, yeah. then we start going backwards. Yeah, exactly. And do you remember the day when they had biometrics um, increasing security? So on the bank, you know, you would have voice authentication, for mm. example. It creates a huge problem. So there are three ways in which you can hack. Well, there are lots of ways in which one can hack biometrics, but um, the idea of replay attack, so this is where they essentially steal your identity and then they use it to con someone, is a very, very common one. You've got spoofing and skimming. Skimming's where they copy your fingerprints, for example, on right. an ATM machine. But uh, can I shake? Can I, do you mind if I play something for you? No, go on. What's we it? know each other. Yeah. Right? We're friends. Yeah. So um, I trust you. Yes. This is, I created this in one minute tops. Hi, Priya. It's Christian. Uh, I just need to grab a picture of your passport and also your driver's license so that the BBC security can let you in as we have some new security protocols in place. Please, can you send them over to this number? Thanks. See you later this evening on The Context. So, no Christian, way. Does, no way. It does sound like you. 60 seconds tops. OK, I use 11 labs, so I.O. 
I knew that you wouldn't get me into trouble because I shouldn't have permission <laughs> to use your voice. But educational purposes again. But the point is, is that you now need to be, it's, it's the point on trust, right? You now need to not, you can't only rely on voice. You can't only rely yeah, well, on I'm, even I'm image. I was going to say, hang on. I, so I, on my Santander account, they, when I ring up and I'm, I'm, I'm go through the, the process, they ask me to say a phrase because they use my voice for yeah, recognition. I, I don't know if do they do that now. I don't know if they do that now. I know that my bank used to do that some time ago, but that's obviously a problem because your voice is available everywhere, right? I picked that up off some YouTube videos. So um, that is an issue. So multi-factor authentication is probably where this is going to go. But for the regular person where you're thinking, hang on a second, when I get that text saying, hey, mum, I've lost my phone, and they're asking me to transfer money to them, the point is, try and verify what's going on. You know the times when you've sat in your phone... But how do you verify if someone appears to you in screen as your boss call and... Them, call them, say, this is what you do. Use a different device, use a different way of contacting them. That's the only way to do it, because if they've done it, they've worked, they may have worked very, very hard on the video, on the image. And that's only going right. to get better. You're going to have to find, yeah, more, more than one way to verify something. And the most important thing is, how many times have you looked at your machine and your computer and ignored the update because it sets you back by Always. a few hours? You don't do that. So, so the, <laughs> the, the reason why is people... I don't actually, know if I should have just said that on live no, television, but, yeah, I, but yeah. I'll start updating. I remember getting into some institutions and their yeah. password was password. Um, but the point is, is that we actually... People use AI to actually stop these attacks from happening. AI to look at, for example, networks, look at anomalies in traffic, look at vulnerabilities in a network. So they're using AI to combat some of the issues created by AI. But every time they send you those updates, it's because they want to update your, your software so it's updated with the latest cyber security. So, th so I'm just saying this to viewers, yeah. stop ignoring it because I used to, but I know not to now. Uh, verifying people and who they are. <laughs> Let's finish with this nice story from... Uh, it's from Moscow, actually. This, so this yeah. guy uh, trained ChatGPT to be him uh, and inst <laughs> instead of going on the, the, the dating sites and swiping right or left, uh, he got AI to do it. Yeah, it sounds like one of the old aunties from the old Indian generation that used to do arranged marriages. <laughs> you know, when someone wasn't married by a certain age, especially a girl, right, a female, um, they'd say, oh, you know, everyone would laugh and say, you're going to go into Auntie G's database. You know, she'll try and, <laughs> she'll try and match you up with someone. And in the old day, olden days, they'd often have these scenarios in vi villages, maybe it still exists in some parts of the world, where, uh, you know, you'd go into the room and the couple don't even talk, right? The aunties do all the talking. So at least here, where yes. he's got AI doing it for it, all I can say is, look, congrats to the happy couple. But, <laughs> oh, because he then married but they, I the person I think, that he chose. He did marry, and he found all but I don't recommend this guys, girls, everybody, whichever gender. I'll tell you why. It's, you're, you're putting the female chat and the female's personal data into a large language model. You're, that, surely that's breaching privacy. So I think this, this has got really big implications, but I don't want to take away the happiness of this wonderful but couple. I'll tell you where it works in a more <laughs> positive way. I take it away from the dating sites. In fact, we did this story about four or five weeks ago where uh, someone who offered uh, tourism advice uh, yeah. And he went to the golf course, but the clients were thought they were talking to him because they were, it was actually giving the responses that it had he had trained it to give. Yeah. And so it did actually give him time away from the job <laughs> and it could, it could work 24-7 for Well, him. that's how companies are creating efficiencies with this, right? So you can train a language model on, for example, your website, all the information on your website, and create a nice chatbot FAQ so you don't have to hire people to sit there on the phone seeing customer service. But, you know, used in this context, I think some of the people at the other end of the Tinder app might feel a little bit differently. But yes, there are good use cases and they're bad. But hey, you know, congrats to Xander. Or, you know, <laughs> I can't Work remember his name. Yeah. Let's hope for us all. Zadan. Let's hope for Zadan. us all. Congratulations, Zadan. That's it. Zadan. We're out of time. Priya, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm not sending you my passport or driving licence details. <laughs> And I will update my computer. Uh, we'll do all this again at the same time next week. Remember, you can catch this program on YouTube as well. Uh, and we are going to start developing it over last week because a lot of you are reacting to it and want to see more of it. So stay tuned. Uh, we will certainly do that in the weeks ahead.